If I had told you 10 years ago that we'd be talking about Martin Truex Jr. being poised to win his second championship in three years, having finished runner-up in the year prior, you'd probably have asked me what I was smoking and then quietly asked if you could try some yourself just for shots and goggles. It's hard to imagine now, but there was a time when one was completely justified in writing off Truex as just another Bush Series bust who couldn't hack it in the top-tier series. Now you might fire back with, but of course Truex was going to wind up being a great driver. Just look at his history up to this point. But as we look at that history, you'll quickly realize that was never the case. It was far from inevitable. The present state of things always seems guaranteed in retrospect, and it can leave us blind to the way things seemed at the time. Perspective is everything when it comes to history. For example, yeah, it seems ridiculous now to send mass cavalry charges against entrenched machine gun emplacements, but during World War I, that seemed to be the only reasonable tactic. Cavalry charges had worked in every other instance up to that point, the tank hadn't been invented yet, and water-cooled machine guns were large, heavy, stationary weapons that were unproven, and couldn't possibly keep up with quite literally the fastest off-road method of transport ever devised up to that point. On paper it should have worked, in practice it didn't. It failed in such spectacular fashion that it seems stupidly obvious now. But again, history requires perspective, so let's dive into it. By the time Homestead rolled around at the end of the 2005 season, Truex was a back-to-back -back champion in the second tier series, then called the Bush Series. He was just the fourth driver to do so in the last two decades. Hopes were high for his first full-time season in 2006. He was coming off two championships in the lower division, and that should have propelled him to a good showing early on. But as we see with champions in the second tier series, that's not always the case. It's actually pretty uncommon, in fact. From 1990 to 2003, the year before Truex's first championship, Bush Series champions account for 119 wins in the Cup Series as of recording this. Pretty impressive until you realize that 93% of those wins are hoarded by just four drivers, Bobby Labonte, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Kevin Harvick, and Greg Biffle. Kevin Harvick alone currently holds 45 of those wins, nearly 38%. The other eight champions making up the remaining 7% have just eight wins between them. Of those guys, five never won a race at the top level, ever. The Bush Series has produced just two Cup Series champions, but at the time it was just one, Bobby Labonte. Kevin Harvick would have to wait until 2014 to win his first championship in the Cup Series. During the mid-2000s, if you won a Bush Series title and moved up to the Cup Series, you had just a 58% chance of scoring a single win, one in three odds of getting double-digit wins over the course of your entire career, and your odds of winning a championship at the Cup level were just 7.6%. At that time, winning a Bush Series title was by no means a good indicator of success in the top tier series. Even with all of this to consider, unbeknownst to Truex or anyone else at the time, his team, DEI, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, that he had driven for in both series for his entire career, was in the stages of dying. What seemed like just a minor dip in performance after their stellar 2004 season ended up being a death spiral. They had scored just one win in the Cup Series in 2005 and would only get one more in 2006, both by Dale Earnhardt Jr. Truex didn't even do enough to win the Rookie of the Year award that year. But to be fair, it was a stacked field that season, with the likes of Clint Boyer, Reed Sorensen, and the eventual Rookie of the Year, Denny Hamlin. Truex posted two top fives, five top tens, with an average finishing position of 20th. Not exactly lighting the world on fire, but a good enough freshman effort to show that he had some level of promise. In 2007, things are starting to look grim for DEI. They're falling apart, and Dale Jr., who goes winless, and Teresa Earnhardt, his stepmother and head of DEI, are in a bitter dispute over a litany of different issues. By the end of the 2007 season, Dale Jr. announces that he will be leaving DEI for Hendrick Motorsports, and the downfall of DEI is all but assured. But during week 13 of competition, Martin Truex wins his first race, and he does it in dominating fashion at Dover International Speedway. Not a terribly far drive from his hometown of Mayetta, New Jersey. It was one of the first Car of Tomorrow races, which had all been dominated by Hendrick up to that point. Plenty of people, including myself, wrote it off as a fluke. He was a new-ish driver driving a car that was an unknown quantity at the time. It would prove to be the only victory for DEI over the course of the 2007 season, and would serve as Truex's lone win for years. He continued driving for the only team he had ever known throughout his career, even as DEI went through merger after merger just to stay afloat. They merged with Ginn Racing in 2008, and then with Chip Ganassi Racing in 2009. In 2010, Chip Ganassi ditched the DEI brand entirely and went back to just being referred to as Chip Ganassi Racing. Also in 2010, Truex had been booted from the team and was looking for a new home. He was a winner, he showed some honest talent at times, and was a moderately hot commodity. 
he landed at Michael Waltrip Racing. At this point, a one-win organization due to a rain-shortened race, MWR was the laughing stock of the NASCAR garage. They had such a bad habit of failing to qualify for races that when Truex was announced to join the team, people joked out loud that Truex had only joined because he wanted Sundays off. However, David Ruderman got the team's first legit win that year at Chicagoland Speedway by straight up wearing Jeff Gordon out in the late stages of the race. Truex would put up numbers that were average for him at that point, but that was a good thing. MWR was supposed to be a downturn in his career, and he's holding steady. Everything's fine. Next year, he would do better, with three top fives and 12 top tens. 2012 would end up being his best statistical year to date, with seven top fives, 19 top tens, a pole, and an average finishing position of 12th. Although he went winless, he's pretty damn close to putting together a championship-caliber drive for the season. His new teammate, Clint Boyer, won three races for MWR and finished second in the standings that year. In just the span of three seasons, MWR has gone from joke organization to championship tier contender. In 2013, after six years of trying, he gets win number two. And he does it at Sonoma, no less, a road course. He's never really excelled at road courses, but he somehow pulls a rabbit out of his hat and wins at a very technical and demanding circuit. He'd string together seven top fives, 15 top tens, and is all set to make the chase that year. At least until... Spingate, as it came to be known, basically rung out as the death nail for MWR. For one intentional spin by Clint Boyer to bring out a late yellow flag and give Truex a better shot at making the chase, they were hit with severe penalties that would effectively torpedo the organization. They would go winless from there on out and close up shop at the end of the 2015 season. That wasn't the end of the repercussions either. Truex was booted from the chase that year as a reprisal. After all, he was the one who benefited most from the late yellow and had just barely snuck into the chase because of it. Worse than that, Truex's sponsor, Napa Auto Parts, were so disgusted by the incident that they pulled their sponsorship, and Truex was let go by the team at the end of the 2013 season. With nowhere to go on such short notice, and most teams being locked into long-term contracts with their established drivers, Truex took the only ride that was available to him, Furniture Row Racing. A backmarker team for most of its existence, Furniture Row, headed by Barney Visser, had made big strides in the right direction, but they were well off the level of competition Truex had become accustomed to. They had just one win to their credit, but Kurt Busch had showed what the team was capable of in 2013. He had never won with them, but he had come damn close a few times and had amassed 11 top fives, 16 top tens, a pole, and an average finish of 14.7. Truex, however, had to overcome the second full reset of his career and dig deep to put forth his best effort with an underfunded team. 2014 would be a steep learning curve for him. He went winless, got just one top five, five top tens, led only a single lap all year, and had an average finish of 20th. At this point, you'd be forgiven if you had thought his career was over. He had had his big breaks and just couldn't make the most of him over the last decade. And now, this would be his grave, where he would fade off into obscurity as just another driver with a couple of wins who had squandered the opportunities laid at his feet and for whom fate had dealt a bad hand. Late in the season, another crushing blow would blindside Truex. Sherry Pollux, his girlfriend of nearly a decade, was suddenly diagnosed with stage 3 ovarian cancer. Five days after the diagnosis, she underwent eight hours of surgery as doctors tried to find and remove the numerous tumors that had originally been thought to be cysts. She had to endure several more procedures and rounds of chemotherapy when it was found that the cancer had spread. While she did eventually fight the cancer off and make a full recovery, Martin Truex's crew chief, Cole Pern, described him as mentally checked out for the remainder of the season. But when 2015 came around, Truex remained with Furniture Row. His girlfriend's victory over cancer had lit a fire under him. If she could fight off late-stage cancer and persevere through the multitudes of surgeries and rounds of chemo, surely he could overcome this dip in his racing career. After staring death in the face, this should be easy. And then, he started winning. At first, it seemed like just a one-off. One win for the 2015 season at Pocono, the third of his career and the second for Furniture Row. But then he kept running up front and made it into the last round of the chase, where he would finish the season sitting fourth in the standings, with an average finish of 12th. Could he maybe make a legit run at a championship? No, that's just ridiculous. He'd never be able to put together that kind of championship run with little old Furniture Row Racing based out of Denver, Colorado. That's just silly. 
but in 2016, he cobbled together four more wins and five poles. In 2017, it seems like this is the year he can make it happen. Going into the chase, he's amassed four wins on the season, but this would be NASCAR history if he could pull this off. The Northeastern United States has never produced a NASCAR Cup champion. Sure, they've given us plenty of winners, Jimmy Spencer, Jeff Bodine, and Regan Smith, just to name a few, but we've never had a champion from that far up the eastern seaboard. This would be a first for the southern base sport of NASCAR. NASCAR Cup Series champions have only ever originated from three areas of the U.S. that span just a handful of states. Alan Kowicki was the first NASCAR Cup champion born north of the Mason-Dixon line, so let's start with him in 1992. He was from Wisconsin, so there's one for the Midwest. Dale Earnhardt in 1993 and 1994. He was from North Carolina. Jeff Gordon in 1995, 97, 98, and 2001. He was born in California but raised in Indiana, so let's go ahead and count both. Texas Terry Labonte was well from Texas. Dale Jarrett in 1999, he was from North Carolina. Bobby Labonte in 2000, he's a Texan just like his brother. Tony Stewart in 2002, he's from Indiana. Matt Kenseth in 2003, he's from Wisconsin again. Kurt Busch in 2004, he's from Las Vegas, Nevada. Tony Stewart again in 2005. Jimmy Johnson in 2006, and a bunch more times he's from California. Brad Keselowski in 2012, hailing from Michigan. Kevin Harvick in 2014, he's a Cali boy. Kyle Busch from Nevada again, and that does it. Without exception, every single NASCAR Cup Series champion has originated either from the Southeast, the Midwest, or way out on the West Coast. A champion from New England would be a huge upset, even in this age of diversity and broad appeal. And as the chase went through the motions, Truex just kept winning. He won the opener at Chicagoland, followed it up later with a win at Charlotte, tacked on one more W at Kansas for good measure, and only had one finish outside the top five for the entire chase entering the final race of the year at Homestead, Miami. As the green flag flies on a sunny afternoon in South Florida, Truex is far and away the favorite to win it all. But just to recap, Truex comes from a part of the country that has never produced a Cup Series champion, his body of work up to this point is is very hit or miss when it comes to predicting success in the upper division, and all throughout his career he has driven for teams that were either knocking on death's door or had no history of consistent success prior to him signing with them. He has had to fight, claw, and scrape for everything he has gotten so far. He has had to build up backmarker teams from nothing just to get to this moment right here, a chance to win a championship. And he did it. Martin Truex won the race and locked up the championship outright. With this, he has eight wins on the season, 19 top fives, three poles, and an average finish of 9.4. A championship caliber season in any year or era of NASCAR, no question. It's no overstatement to say that this was a monolithic achievement. At every turn of his career, Lady Luck dealt Truex a bad hand and stacked the odds against him. But every time, he ignored the odds, put his nose to the grindstone, went out there, drove his heart out, and the odds just disappeared. On multiple occasions, you could have pronounced his career dead at the scene, but he didn't care. He just kept trying, and success found him in the end. At this point, I'm done doubting Martin Truex Jr. He could get fired by Joe Gibbs Racing tomorrow and land at Front Row Motorsports or some other mid-pack team, and you know what I'd say? Let's see what he does this time.